And, 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 and on that note, as Christians, um, we participate in basically two God-ordained sacraments or ordinances, depending on your background, uh, that celebrate what God has done for us. And those two things are, are simply communion and, and baptism. And, and of course, communion here at Glory, we celebrate that on the first Sunday of each month. You celebrate that on a regular basis. Some churches do it every Sunday. Some churches do it quarterly, but we do it once a month here at the first Sunday of the month. And, and we do that regularly. And then we also also do baptisms. Baptisms tend to be more of an as-needed kind of thing, but baptism and the communion kind of go hand in hand as, as ways that we as Christians make public declarations that our lives are devoted to God. And as I mentioned, today we get to celebrate baptisms, and, and I hope, I do hope, you're as excited about it as I am. Now, now there's a story that's told, uh, there's this uh, there's this old drunk who, who stumbles along one day and happens to come upon a baptismal service down in the lake. And, and he proceeded to, as he was watching this, walk out into the water and stand next to the preacher. Now the, the minister notices this old drunk and he, uh, he says, Mister, are you ready to find Jesus? And the drunk looks back and says, Yes, preacher, sure thing, I am. So the minister grabbed him and he dunks the fellow under the water and pulls him right back up. And he says, have you found Jesus? Well, no, pastor, I haven't. So the pastor grabs him again and he dunks him down and holds him down for a little bit longer this time and brings him back up and says, brother, have you found Jesus? He sputters and, no, I, 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 I haven't found Jesus, pastor. Well, in disgust, he grabs him again. He holds him underwater. Now for like 30 seconds this time. He holds him for a long time and finally lifts him up out of the water in a, a fairly harsh tone. He says, brother, ha are you sure you haven't found Jesus yet? Uh, the old drunk kind of wiped his eyes and spit out some water. And he looked at the preacher and he said, are you sure this is where he fell in? <laughs> This morning, we aren't looking for Jesus in the water, right? So why do we dunk people into the water? I mean, I, I take a bath, I go swimming. Uh, and what makes this event different or what makes this more important? And we're going to talk about that today. Uh, because you see, the, the, the human mind trying to explain baptism is like, like trying to play Beethoven on a harmonica. Uh, then the music is simply too majestic for that instrument. We cannot fully appreciate what this moment today as we are going into baptism. We can't completely appreciate what this moment means in heaven. Any, any words that I could even share today on baptism uh, are simply human efforts trying to understand what is truly a, a holy event. And as we, as we look at baptism and in the history of the church, uh, there's a danger of one of two directions, of swinging too far to either extremes. It, it, it's very easy that, that we can make baptism too important, or we can make bat, baptism not important enough. We can either deify it, or we can trivialize it. And, and truthfully, both sides of that equation are, are equally dangerous. You know, one person says, uh, I, I'm saved because I was baptized, right? And the other person says, I'm saved so I don't need to be baptized, right? And the challenge is to let that pendulum swing, but, but to find a, a middle ground, a, a better place between the two of those viewpoints. And this is done simply by placing the emphasis where it should be put. And that is at the foot of the cross. See, baptism is kind of like a, a, a precious diamond, right? Uh, when I but my, I was going to marry my wife before I even asked her. I went and I shopped for diamonds for a long time. I, I went and sat down at a, at, a, at a diamond place, not a jewelry store, a place that literally only sells diamonds. And I, I went through hundreds of diamonds, looking through a loop, looking through scopes, learning all about the C's, cut, color, clarity, all those kinds of things, and, and learned a lot about diamonds. And was, was amazed, as a man, I'd never really paid attention to diamonds, but, but, but the diamond is, is a great kind of backdrop idea for, for the idea of baptism, um, showing us uh, some similarities. Because when we look at a diamond, and we think about a diamond in the context of comparing it to, to baptism, when, when you look at it just right, the diamond explodes with splendor, right? If, it, if it's clean and it's polished and it's set right, it's beautiful and looks amazing. 
Um, and baptism kind of does the same thing. It reveals the beauty of the cross and the darkness of our sin. And, and as a diamond has many facets as it's been cut, so does baptism. It has many different sides to it. Baptism it, it, imagery is about cleansing and burial and resurrection and the death of the old and the birth of the new. And, and just as you know that diamond on, on your ring there has no light within it, so there is not specifically any inherent power in baptism itself. But just the same as that that diamond refracts refracts light into so many colors and directions, so too does baptism reflect and refract the, 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 the many facets of God's beautiful and wonderful grace. Now once a once a person admits that they are a sinner and turns then to Christ for salvation, some step must be taken to, to proclaim to the heavens and to the earth that he or she is a, is a follower of Christ. And baptism is that step. Baptism is that, that initial and, and sometimes even immediate step of obedience by someone who is willing and ready to declare their faith to everyone else. And so important is this step that as we read through the New Testament in particular, we see every single convert in the New Testament, except for one, was baptized. Every single person who came to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior, except for one, were baptized. The exception, of course, if you don't know your New Testament, is the thief upon the cross. When Jesus was crucified, there was two other men along with him, and uh, one came to have a relationship with Jesus, literally, while they were there on the cross, dying. And you see, this this thief on the cross is, is a crucial exception for us to understand. Because it's that, that story of his conversion that drives people who want to be very dogmatic about things. It drives them crazy, right? They want rules to follow, and they, they want everything to fit nicely into one little box. But all of a sudden, you got this guy that comes along, and he's promised that he will be in paradise with Christ. Um, this is a man who, who didn't probably know any religious creeds. This is a man who never went to confirmation class. He never had any christening. He, he never went to any catechisms. This is a man who was never baptized. He didn't know Christ until he was there upon the cross. A man who had never set foot in the temple, who never went to church, never had given an offering, and never was baptized. A man who, as far as we know, only one time in his life probably ever said a prayer. But that one prayer there on the cross was enough. And so this man has a, has a crucial role in the gospel drama. The thief reminds us that Though we might be dogmatic. Dogma is the rules and regulations that we want to follow in faith. The things that we believe. Though we might have a really good theology. We might have really dead on, dead central doctrines. In the end though, it's Jesus that saves us. Not those other things. Now as we talk about it, does a thief story negate the importance of obedience on our part? No. It simply puts obedience into the proper perspective. Any step that that we take is a response to salvation that has been offered to us, not an effort for salvation to be earned. In the end, God has the right to save any heart He chooses. And only He and He alone can see our heart and know what's in it. A helpful uh, verse for us to understand baptism comes from 1 Peter 3. Uh, verse 21. And there it says, baptism, which responds to this, which is Noah's ark savings God's people. So baptism, which responds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This promise is vital. See, baptism Baptism, baptism separates the, the, the tire kickers from the car buyers, right? If you're a car salesman, you need to be able to identify pretty quickly which one is which. When you're, uh, another example would be is, would you be comfortable marrying somebody who wanted to keep your marriage secret? Think about that for a second. Well, God doesn't want to have that sort of secret relationship with you either. It's one thing to say down in the the privacy of your own heart that 
oh yeah, sure, I'm a, I'm a sinner, right? I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. But it's quite another thing to walk out of the shadows and to stand before family and friends and colleagues and to publicly state that Christ is your forgiver and your master. When we take the step of baptism, it raises the ante. And Jesus, Jesus commanded all of his followers to prove it. To make the pledge, to make the the public demonstration in baptism. Among his very final words that he left us with while he was here on earth comes from Matthew 28, 19, a passage most of us would know. It's the Great Commission where Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. As we read through the New Testament, we'll find that Baptism was no just casual custom. It wasn't, wasn't just some kind of ho-hum ritual. Baptism was, and, and is, a pledge made to God from a good conscience. Baptism is a vow. It's a, it, it's a holy moment. A sacred vow of the believer to follow Christ. And just as a wedding celebrates the, the fusion of two into one, two hearts becoming one, So baptism celebrates the union of of a sinner with a Savior. Now, in a wedding, do a bride and groom understand all the implications of of what it is to be married? Certainly no, they don't. They don't know every every challenge that they're going to face. They don't know every threat that they're going to face. But they do know, they do know that they love one another. And they vow to be faithful to one another till the end. When a a willing believer enters into the waters of baptism, does he or she know all the implications? No, they don't. They don't know every temptation that's going to come. They don't know every challenge they're going to experience. But they do know the love of God, and they are responding to Him. Please understand, it's not the act that saves us. But it is uh, this act that, that symbolizes how it is that we are saved. The invisible work of the Holy Spirit is visibly demonstrated and dramatized as we go out into that water. In in a a believer's baptism, and you'll see this when we get down to Fishers, when you go down into the water, it symbolizes as if we were going to death as Christ died on the cross. And then as the, the water covers you, it's as if the grave is covering the dead. And then when we rise up, when we come out of the grave, it's as if we are along with Christ conquering death for those who would believe in Him. The parallels are unmistakable in baptism. We are identifying ourselves with Jesus Christ. That's why we don't take baptism lightly. Baptism is a, a willing plunge of the body and the soul into the promise and power of Christ. And it's in this this ritual washing, that it signifies that we as sinners, that we are are signifying and admitting that apart from Christ we are dirty, but in Christ we have been made clean and pure. The ritual of of the burial and, and as we do baptisms shows that we are willing to, to die to ourself, to die to sin, And then, knowing, as we will come back out again, that we can and have been made alive again in Christ. In baptism, we are showing that Christ's death might become my death, and Christ's resurrection has become my resurrection. And when we talk about baptism, inevitably, a number of questions come up, right? Some of you are probably sitting there with questions on your mind. And, and I want to address a few of them briefly. And if you want, at some future time, not today, uh, I would be happy to sit down. We can dig in more deeply into any of these and plenty of others one-on-one if you still have questions. The New Testament talks about baptism in a number of places. and has a lot to say, more than I could ever speak on in just this one little time we have here. But would love to sit down with you in some other context. But the first question that sometimes comes to mind when we're looking and talking about baptism is simply this. Does baptism save us? Well, I, I answered this a moment ago, but so that I'm abundantly clear, 
No, baptism does not save us. It's clearly established in the Bible that you are saved only by accepting God's free gift of grace that comes through Christ and Christ alone. God saves you by His grace when you believe. And so you, you can't take credit for this. This is a gift from God. Salvation is, is not some sort of reward for the good things that we have done so that no man might boast, it tells us in Ephesians 2, 8-9. through 9. Well, if it doesn't save me then, Pastor, why should I get baptized, right? Well, Getting baptized is an opportunity for us to follow Jesus' own example. Jesus himself was baptized, as we see in, in Mark 1, 9 through 11. Jesus wasn't a sinner. We need to be clear about that. He was different than we are. Yet, nonetheless, Jesus humbled himself in obedience to identify with us and to give us an example which to follow. And as Christ followers, we should want to obey Jesus by doing what he said and did. And, and participating in baptism is also an act of obedience. Throughout Scripture, we are taught to live a life of obedience, to back up our faith with actions, so that we will grow closer in our relationship with God and, and live a life that points to Him. And baptism is a big, important step and sometimes a first step for those who choose to follow Christ. Baptism also allows us to go public with our faith. Baptism is a way for us to declare that we are indeed a follower of Jesus. It's a public profession of your faith in Jesus. You are making a commitment to Him when you are baptized. And, and this is, again, a, a big next step after your salvation. And it's an important foundation for us who choose to call on and follow Christ. Now, the next question that always comes to mind, and I should... All the cards be on the table, so I'm open and honest. I was born, baptized, confirmed as a child, Lutheran. I didn't come to faith until I was 19 years old in college. So I've been on both sides of this equation. I've been down this road a long, long time and learned a lot about it. But should we, should we baptize infants or should we baptize adults? Eh, that's a very good question, valid. Now some churches, of course, baptize infants. Some don't. And while Christians can certainly debate this. We should never divide over this. I mean, obviously, there, there are bright, godly people of both persuasions. But, as we talk about it, we should be clear that there is a, a very clear and consistent pattern in the New Testament that baptism is, is, is a pledge made by those who were old enough to recognize their sin, mature enough to comprehend the significance of the death of Christ, and then independent enough to, to commit themselves to following Jesus. And a great example of that comes from Acts 2.38. And in Acts 2.38, the context is, this is the first time Peter preaches. This is after the, the Holy Spirit comes down upon the followers of Jesus. And he goes out and starts speaking and starts preaching. And in that day, 3,000 people came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And it says then that, that Peter said to them, Then repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will then receive uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, so here at Glory... We don't baptize infants. Instead of baptizing infants, we, we, we encourage Christian parents to participate in a child dedication. And this is a, this is a ceremony that uh, parents are going to formally call upon God's blessing upon their child, as well as publicly commit to raise their children in accordance to Scripture. And along with that, as we dedicate children... We as a church come alongside of that family and we commit ourselves to helping raise that child in the ways of the God to the very best of our ability as well, which is an important thing, working on that hand in hand. So you might be saying, well then, Pastor, what if I was, what if I was baptized as an infant in another church? Should I get baptized again? Well, before we get fully into that, I want to say first, if you were baptized as an infant, you should be grateful that you had parents who cared enough about you and for you to set you apart for God. 
And because of their devotion then, now you have an opportunity to complete their prayer from that time by willingly submitting to a believer's baptism. Believer's baptism is not a sign of disrespect for what your parents did. In fact, it can be seen as a fulfillment for the thing that they started, a fulfillment for their prayers on that day. Be thankful for the heritage of concerned parents. And then once you personally come to an age where you can decide for yourself to follow Christ, believer's baptism is that next step. Don't be afraid to be rebaptized. That's one of the things that held me back for a number of years, and I regret that. I wish I would have been baptized sooner. I had been thinking for years and years, literally years and years. It took me almost a decade. I knew I should go be baptized. But I always wondered a little bit, would this be disrespecting my parents and what they started? Would they take offense if I did this? And, and, and truly, I struggled with this for a long time. And then I decided I was going to get baptized. I was baptized in one of our sister converged churches in South Dakota. And I struggled with it to the point in which a week before the baptism, I had yet to tell my parents I was going to get baptized. Finally, I was like, I, this is too important. I've got to tell them. So I called my mom and dad and said, uh, I don't know what you're doing next week. I lived about 70 miles away from them where the baptism would take place. I said, I don't know what you're doing next week, mom and dad, but uh, if you're free, I'm going to get baptized. What do you think of that? They just shouted and cheered at the other end of the phone. Oh, thank you. Right? They were ecstatic. Praise the Lord, you're, you're taking this next step of faith. They weren't offended. They rejoiced. And so I, I think that truly is a good thing. And if that's you, I can relate to your story. Don't be afraid to get rebaptized as an act of worship and obedience to Christ. Well now, there's the other side. Pastor, what if I believe baptism is just simply, that's just like a technicality, right? Well, if you're a Christian, and you're holding off and being baptized because you, you feel it's unnecessary, I would challenge you to take a little bit of time, examine your motives, and pray to God to help you grasp His heart for what baptism means. Ask yourself, why is it that I don't want to be baptized? And, 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 and honestly ask, am I willfully disobeying? If you're waiting for God to directly prompt you to be baptized, you don't need to wait any longer, folks. He already makes that, that prompting. He offers that challenge to each and every Christ follower in His Word, in the Bible. And maybe that's why God brought you here today. Don't allow baptism, though, as we talk about this, to become something that it isn't either, though. Apart from the cross, baptism has no significance. If you're trusting in a baptism, a dunking down into the water to save you, you've missed the entire message of what grace is, of the gift offered by the love, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I would challenge you, think this over and take this as the weighty but awesome thing that it is. I want to close today with just a, a, a couple of thoughts. First, maybe you're here today and you haven't even taken the first step, right? Maybe you haven't taken that first step of faith, putting your hope and trust for salvation, putting your hope and trust for the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that, that's the first step, folks. I would encourage you to do that. Now, here, today, in just a minute, we're going to pray. And if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, do it today. And second, if you've heard all of this that I've been talking about this morning on baptism, and, and maybe the Holy Spirit is working on your heart and telling you that today is the day that you need to be baptized. Let's get it done. We can add to that list. We got time. Join us at Fishers. Talk with the deacons. And we're going to get you baptized. Today is the very best day of your life ever for this to happen. I don't care if you have your good going to church clothes on and you didn't bring a swimsuit. I don't care. I don't care if you didn't bring a towel. I don't care if you're worried that your hair is going to get wet. Neither should you. 
We have some people who kindly have brought extra towels just in case, actually. Thank you, Judy. Maybe some others. If you want to get baptized today, let's get it done. If you're feeling convicted that you need to get baptized, let's do it today. What is required, as I said, is get to Fisher's, talk briefly with our deacons, share your faith story. You can even maybe do this while you're snarfing down a brat. You know, share your faith story with them. They're really nice guys. They're really good listeners. And once that's done, Pastor Kevin and I are going to get you out to Lake Mille Lacs. And we're going to baptize you. I want to give some final instructions, but before I give those, before we leave and before we get out of here, I, I want to stop and I want to pause and spend just a little minute in prayer before we end. So would you all please join me? Father God, we rejoice on this day. We rejoice, God, for just the work of the Holy Spirit as you've been working in this church to grow this church, as you've been working in our hearts to grow our hearts, as you've been working in our families to grow our families. God, I, I just praise you for the amazing things that you have done. I, I first thank you personally for the gift of salvation that I have and the freedom that I found in that. And God, there might be someone here today who has just been holding off, been wondering, been waiting, didn't know if they were ready to make that commitment to follow you. God, maybe today is the day that that person's ready to step over that line of faith. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would just invite you to pray along with me here. Just say these words. You don't even have to say them out loud. Just, God our Father, I believe that out of your infinite love, that you have created me. And God, in a in, in countless number of ways, I have shunned your love and I have sinned. And Lord, in this moment, I repent of each and every one of those sins. Please forgive me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die for me, to save me from eternal death. Lord, today I choose to enter into a relationship with you and to place Jesus at the center of my heart. God, I, I surrender to him as Lord over my whole life. And I ask you now to flood my soul with the gift of the Holy Spirit so that my life will be transformed. Give me the grace and the courage to live as your disciple for the rest of my days. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we continue praying, God, we rejoice for any who have taken that step. And God, we also want to pray for those who are being baptized. Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of baptism. That we can publicly declare your love and passion for us. And then we can in return share that love and passion back to you. God, I just pray for your goodness and your blessing to be poured out on those being baptized today. I pray that you would work deeply in their hearts and in their souls to renew and refresh each and every day their heart and spirit. God, would you guide their footsteps, give them hope and a vision for their future. Lord, today the past is gone. If we follow Jesus, if he is our Lord and Savior, Savior we stand free, whole and loved and forgiven. Father, encircle us this day with your promises and fill our hearts with joy. May this day be one that we cherish for as long as we can remember. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.